start our recording. Looks like that is running, and again, welcome. Uh, the topic this week is the new overtime rules that have been uh, recommended to us. Uh, there is, uh, from what I have read lately, a little bit of discussion going on about whether we need to, to postpone that a little bit to give folks a chance to kind of figure it out. Uh, but uh, let me start by introducing our guest moderator. Uh, Gene, if you have the ability to share your video so they can get an idea of uh, who we're dealing with here. There you are. Good deal. This is uh, Mrs. Gina Wilson. She is the Director of Human Resources at Georgia Southwestern. She is a graduate of Southwestern, I think two times over. She got an HR degree and sat through this very class in the classroom, current issues. And um, I think got a master's degree, an MBA at Georgia Southwestern. She can jump in and, and tell us if that's wrong. Um, but she worked for a while, I think, with, uh, if memory serves, with Harvey's Supermarket doing their HR stuff. And then when the former head of human resources at GSW retired after a long and distinguished career, Gina applied for the job. Folks recognized her talent, and they have brought her in to, to run all of HR for Georgia Southwestern. So um, she is a, a very good participant on this call from a couple of perspectives. A, she's been in the, in the, in the classroom. Uh, this was uh, obviously not a, one of the issues back when she took the class, but uh, she's, she's familiar with the process of kind of asking the questions, figuring out what the issues are, uh, making sense out of what the options are, uh, but she also has the real world experience that we've seen from the other guest moderators. And uh, this is uh, when I gave uh, a handful of folks an opportunity to choose the topics they wanted to participate in. Gina was one of the first ones to respond and she jumped on this topic real quick and it is very, very real time to her because uh, I've been seeing emails this week about um, training sessions for folks to help them help uh, people get ready for the, the changes that this is going to involve with our organization and um, what they can expect to see from that. And uh, let, me, let me start the call by turning it over to Renee for a few minutes. Renee Thomas did the, the background work for us, found some of the SHRM articles and came up with the discussion question and the talking points. So uh, Renee, just in a matter of a couple of minutes maybe, give us the overview of what this is all about and uh, what it means. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so this is about the new overtime rules um, that are scheduled to go into effect uh, starting December 1st, so a little bit more than a month. Um, this is because um, in 2014, President Obama decided that we needed to have an update on the rules um, to reflect the original intent of the Fair Labor Standards Act for a fair day's pay for a hard day's work. And I was wondering, like, why, why that number of 47476 a year? And so um, that's the standard salary level um, at the 40th percentile of earnings of full-time salaried workers in the lowest wage since, uh, since I'm so, <laughs> just woo, <laughs> since this region, which is the South. <laughs> um, and so that was either 913 a week or 47,476 a year. Um, and then the rule will be updated every three years. Um, so the next update will be in January 2020. Um, so it sounds great. Either we get more money in our pockets or more time off. But there's some concerns. And so that is what I discussed in the articles about people might have to work off the clock or get other jobs. Um, stuff like that. So, okay, I'll keep talking. <laughs> so, um, either either employees can um, um, give their employers can give employees salaries that meet the threshold. Um, if they're paid less than that, then they get time and a half for over forty hours. <clears throat> and they can uh, use bonuses and incentives to make up 10% of that salary. Okay, let's, uh, let's pause there for a moment. 
uh, I neglected to give you an opportunity to tell Gina who you were. I introduced her to you. Um, but um, tell her tell her where you are geographically and how close you are to graduation. And uh, Gina, as you know, current issues is a capstone required class for HR majors. It's very, very rare for anybody to take this class that's not an HR major. So we'll go into this with the assumption that they all are, in fact, HR majors and not just somebody looking for an elective and uh, regretting their choice now. Um, so tell us who you are and where you are and how close you are to graduation. Amy, why don't we let you go first? Don't forget to unmute your mic. Okay. I'm Amy Clark. Currently, I'm in Leesburg, Georgia. Um, I'm currently an HR specialist with the Marine Corps base, and I am uh, approximately one semester, maybe two semesters away from graduating, and I am an HR um, degree major. Okay, so maybe May of 17? Correct, yes. Good deal. All right, Kenneth, your turn. HR uh, major. Uh, We're losing you a little bit. Start over again for me. Okay. Um, Kenneth Spry, uh, College Park, Georgia, Atlanta, uh, HR major. I graduate this coming December, and uh, I'm an administrative specialist with the FAA. Okay, so a little bit over a month. Good deal. All right, Lauren, your turn. Can you see me? Is my camera working? Uh, no, it's not right now. Looks like he just dropped you off the call and brought you back, so you may be having some technical problems. Uh, in the absence of being able to get a video, you just, just talk to us. I'm Lauren, and I am graduating this December, and I am currently in Leesburg, Georgia. Okay, good deal. Uh, Renee. I'm Renee, and I live in North Cross, Georgia, and I hope to graduate in May. All right, and uh, Amy told us what you do. Renee, what do you do? I'm an assistant manager at Papa John's. Good deal. All right, and Kenneth, did you tell us? Yeah, I'm uh, admin for FAA. Good deal. All right, and Lauren is full-time student, pretty much, right? Yes, sir. She's a, she's also a volunteer with the uh, election board, and was just telling me that uh, the week that she has the topic is the the night that, that night when we have the phone call during her her team lead week is the presidential election. So she is uh, she came by my office today with a little bit concerned about whether she'd be able to be home in time for the phone call. Um, but I told her to, to take care of the presidential election and make sure that works out right and then um, join us as, as quickly as she could after that. So, all right, uh, Gina, do you have any, any thoughts for them, uh, words of encouragement or wisdom or uh, something that you'd like to get the conversation started in terms of the new overtime rules? Sure, and I apologize. My video is not working and will only connect for a moment, but I hope everybody can hear me okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, and um, congratulations, all of you, because you picked the best major at Georgia Southwestern. I'm not biased at all, but yes, I think you did. And um, good luck to those of you graduating in December and those graduating in May. Just hang in there. Um, I, like Dr. Grimes said, went through the same program, same class that you're going through. And this class especially, and I always say this to Dr. Grimes' current issues class, this class was one of the most beneficial classes that I took as far as preparing me for a role in human resources. The work that you're doing, the, res the research that you're doing, the project that you're working on for the end of the semester is so valuable and will set you up for real life experience when you get out there into the world of human resources. So um, hang in there. It will not be much longer. You'll be finished and you'll be started on your career. So congratulations. Um, when Dr. Grimes sent out the link for us to register for a topic with this class, I jumped on the FLSA overtime rules because it's such a hot topic right now. And it's something that no matter what industry you're with, every industry is dealing with the new overtime work rules. So it doesn't matter if it's higher education, um, the student who's with the FAA, 
Papa John's, the, the Marine base, it doesn't matter. Everywhere you look, every employer has to um, kind of regroup and look at their policies and procedures in dealing with these rules. All right. Um, what brought it all about? You posing that for me or the students? Uh, anybody, jump in with that too. Well, you know, the Department of Labor and really the, the Obama administration had been um, approaching the Department of Labor for quite some time asking, you know, to raise the um, salary threshold for quite a while. And um, I'm sure you've seen in the research, the original proposal um, was actually a little over 51000 a year, and it got um, decreased to the 47000 which is where we're at now. So quite a few changes that were made, but it's been a number of years. It's been going back and forth between um, uh, the Department of Labor and the Obama administration to try to raise that threshold. And, you know, originally they were looking at not only the salaries, but the duties test as well. That did not um, go through. They didn't touch the duties test this time. And in the original um, proposal, the three-year increase that Renee mentioned was actually a yearly increase. And that also did not pass. They amended it to a three increase. So there were some changes. Um, as Dr. Grimes mentioned, there are some states. I think last I checked, I think it was 23 states who are trying to appeal the new overtime provisions. It's passed the House. It um, is now on its way to the Senate, but the President's office has stated that they will veto if it passes the Senate. So once it lands on the President's desk, he has uh, announced he will veto any type of overrule to the changes. Let me let me inter interrupt here for a second. So if, if we're thinking about the the historical picture, what created the threshold initially was a law that came through Congress. Is that right? Yes. Fair Labor Standards Act. Okay. So it, it we, we could argue that it should have been going up periodically anyway, cost of living, that kind of thing. But what really got to the, the boiling point was the Department of Labor, which is unelected, it's appointed, um, deciding basically that now was the time we had to do something. And they issued a ruling that has the effect of law, even though it is in effect, I guess, amending a law that's on the books. Correct. All right. So one of the first things that we, we might want to discuss or at least have an understanding about if, if we were in Gina's position and senior management was saying, well, what is this that I'm reading? How is it going to impact us? Do we have to do this? Do we have a choice? Uh, what's one of the class? Share some ideas here. Um, what are the what are the challenges with this? I mean, if let me let me back up and not ask that question yet. Um, Gina was talking about how uh, the the U.S. House of Representatives has voted to postpone the implementation of this, and the Senate was getting ready to take up the discussion and potentially vote to agree to postpone the implementation of this, and the president has said that he will veto this. Um, so I, one of the first things that I, that I think, don't know that we really have any input in, but just for the sake of discussion, um, what is what is really the grounds for this um, that allows the Department of Labor to amend a federal law in such a way that when Congress tries to step back into the legislative part of this whole process, the way that it was designed, that the president has the ability to veto something. In effect, giving the Department of Labor lawmaking capabilities that are beyond the scope of the, the Congress to, to uh, impact. And I hope that made sense. What thoughts are you having?
could you maybe rephrase that one more time? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can. Um, what I'm driving at is that this we're talking about a federal law, uh, the, the um, Fair Labor Standards Act. It's a, a law that was duly passed by Congress. It has the force of law by the United States government. But what we're talking about doing here is basically amending the law by raising the, the number that is in the body of the law. Um, and, and normally we would say that in order to amend the law, Congress has got to pass an amendment to the law or create a new law to supersede the old law. But what we've got in effect here is an appointed uh, body, the Department of Labor, coming out with a ruling that Congress is trying to delay but it doesn't look like Congress is going to have the, the ability to actually do that. So one of the first conversations, again, is understanding that we really don't have any input in the matter. We can protest all we want to, but the Department of Labor and the President basically are going to do what they want to do. Um, is this the right way to do it? Should this go through Congress in the in the sense of the president saying, this is what I'd like you to do, I want you all to go talk about it, rather than me or the Department of Labor throwing out a number, let's agree that we need to increase it somehow. You guys and ladies go talk about what to do and how to do it and send me a bill. Well, considering that the Department of Labor is the agency that, um, you know, I guess, um, monitors and covers the employment aspect of uh, wage and hour, you would think that they would be more knowledgeable to, than just Congress in general. So I would think that if anybody was going to make any recommendations or, um, you know, write any laws or regulations, it would be the people that were the subject matter experts, which would be the Department of Labor. Okay. Good thoughts. Who else? And let me say that this is this is certainly outside the scope of what current issues really needs to be dealing with because ultimately they're not going to come to the HR folks and say is this right or wrong? Should they be allowed to do this? But I think it's an interesting starting point for the discussion to try to understand what's going on. Um, and I would I would agree with Amy that uh, the Department of Labor is the experts. Uh, but the, the question that I'm really trying to ask here is, does the Department of Labor, does, not does, um, should, do you think that the Department of Labor should act in an advisor, in adv try again, in advisory capacity or in a decision-making capacity? I think Gina's sitting out there going, wait a minute, this is not the discussion I thought I signed up for. No, I think it's a valuable discussion because I'll tell you what's happening. Although we as employers really have no control, it's fascinating to watch what's happening because you'll have managers who see it in the news and they'll come, like Dr. Grimes mentioned, you know, you may have supervisors who say, does this really impact us? Do we have to change? You know, you may have employees stating, do I really have to go to hourly? Do I really have to punch a time clock now? I saw on the news that George is appealing this. This isn't really going through, right? So it's it's fascinating to watch. And HR professionals, we need to be mindful of what's happening with Congress because it, 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 Dr. Grimes hit the nail on the head. We have no control. We have to move forward with our implementation, with compliance, and making sure that our employees are set by December 1st. Um, but yes, in, in monitoring that, I have had managers come up and say, well, I thought this was on hold, you know, because they're seeing it in the news, um, but they're not really doing a very good job in the news of explaining what's really happening with that. So while we may not have control over it, we need to be mindful of what's going on. Okay. And I think this process is becoming more and more common. Um, and th I think the way that the, the, uh, the theory was designed, Congress is the one who did this kind of stuff, but we're seeing more and more, not just with Department of Labor, but with the SEC, with all the other EPA and all the other um, National Labor Relations Board, 
more and more agencies are issuing regulations that have the impact of law when we might argue from a political standpoint they don't have the authority to do that um, but we see so much inefficiency in Washington and so much uh, gridlock and folks who not only can't agree they can't even talk that we start kind of grasping at straws so to speak and the president says you know what there's no way that I'm ever going to get those people to, to even talk about this much less make some decisions on this we'll just have to do it ourselves and, and we've kind of allowed them to do that Department of Labor has the ability to make decisions like this although I don't know that that was really the what it was intended uh, I think that they were probably intended to be a recommending body. What's going on? What do we need to do? Make a suggestion. A Congress takes it and does something with it. Um, National Labor Relations Board and unions and all that kind of stuff, I think, was designed uh, for them to make recommendations and to make decisions on grievances and things like that. But it's, it's kind of escalated a little bit. Uh, Kenneth, got your hand up. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting over here doing my best with, uh, with Google trying to get an understanding. Um, when I worked at the FAA headquarters in DC, I worked in the Office of Rulemaking, which is basically all of the, the rules and policies that the airlines and pilots have to follow um, is spit out by Office of Rulemaking and it goes through a similar process that the DOL is going through. I guess just hearing it and kind of applying it, I, I kind of agree with you where it's like it's so hard to get stuff through Congress that you basically go, you know what, this hasn't been tried or this hasn't been done in this particular manner. Let's just go ahead and throw out a, a new rule, a new rule slash regulation. Um, and if Congress has an issue with it, they'll be spurred into action and in doing something. Uh, otherwise, it'll be rule of law, we'll have it, and we'll keep rolling. Okay. Well, I think part of the part of the understanding of the framework of it is being able to describe to the folks who are asking the questions, the, the CFO, uh, the CEO, those kind of folks, what this all means and how it came about. And um, as uh, Gina was saying, does this really impact us? Is this something we have to do or is this a, a, a strong suggestion or whatever? Um, understanding what the roles of the players are is important and understanding um, the way that things are going, uh, that this is, 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 is here. It's going to happen and uh, we've got to figure out a way to deal with it. So I think maybe the, the second question is understanding what this means. Um, what we've done in a lot of cases in the past, assuming that we could justify the decision, was put people on salary uh, at a, a, a reasonably low number. Uh, and I don't, uh, honest, uh, I got to confess to uh, to all of you that I, I don't know what the number is currently. I do know. 60. <laughs> Say that one more time. It's 23,660. 23,6, let's call it. Yep. We would put people uh, somewhere at the 23, 6, maybe up to 28 or 30 or something, and we'd say, you're salaried, I don't have to pay you overtime, and what were we, what were we as employees finding was happening to the amount of time we were putting in on the job? Renee might could answer this one for us. Yep, there you go, raised your hand. What was happening? Um, well, I know that, you know, if they were making a salary, they were working a lot more than 40 hours. <laughs> so, All like, right. my, boss has, my boss has to, he's required to work 60 hours a week. No less. <laughs> he can work more, but no less. All right. Well, this, this ties in a little bit to uh, another discussion that I think that we had in our class. I've, I've also got a master's level class that's kind of doing the same kind of thing. They're taking some of the same topics, um, doing doing more topics, but uh, I don't remember who's done what topic. But uh, did we talk in this class about the uh, minimum wage and the increasing of the minimum wage? Anybody remember that?
Uh, yes. yes, we did. We did talk about that and uh, the, the impact that raising the minimum wage has potentially on small businesses and whatnot. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to tie that in a little bit with this as well because have, have any of you done the basic math? What, what is 23,660 come to per hour if you work a standard 52 week, 40 hour work week? Kenneth's doing some math. Doesn't have his phone on though. Microphone, Amy. Isn't it about eleven dollars and thirty-seven and a half cents? Eleven thirty. All right, twenty-three six sixty divided by two thousand eighty hours. Yeah, it's about eleven seventy-ish per hour. Um, we're talking about raising the minimum wage to fifteen. Um, and if that happens with no corresponding changes to our our salary rules, what uh, what happens effectively is that our hourly people make more than our salary people. And especially when you consider, as Renee was saying, that um, she has a colleague that's expected to work sixty a week. What does that come to mathematically? Well, if we've got uh, 60 hours, 52 weeks a year, that's 3120 per year. And 23,660 divided by those 3120 hours is $7.58 an hour. What were we seeing happen very frequently? We were seeing folks who were expected to put in a lot of extra time, which effectively reduced their hourly wage down to something that we would argue was, was substandard, especially for somebody that was given the responsibilities of management, right? So let's say we, we, we buy into the idea that we need to raise this, this salary cap. What, what does that effectively do? We raise this from 23.6 to 47. It means that 758 that they were previously making is um, they're going to their hourly wage, even if they make more than even if they work more than 40 hours a week, is going to better balance itself out. Okay. What does what does the law do right now, with with the number of twenty three six sixty? What does what does the law do? What's the significance of twenty three six? Don't have your microphone, Kenneth. All right. Not trying to talk. Okay. What is what does this law do? What does the Fair Labor Standards Act and the the uh, the overtime law do, Renee? Um, it is. Oh my gosh, I just had it in my head. Basically, it's so if you let's see if, we can, if you let's see if less we than that, um, and you work overtime and you're exempt or whatever, you have to be paid overtime time and a half. All right. Yeah, let's see if we can steer the answer using the words exempt and non-exempt, which is the which is one of the foundations of the, the Fair, Labor, Fair Labor Standards Act. Who remembers from your HR law what the whole idea of exempt and non-exempt is? God, that was a whole other class at least a semester ago. Are you kidding me? You expect me to remember all that? What's exempt and non-exempt? Renee, Renee's first. Um, I guess exempt is where you don't get the overtime. Okay. Uh, All right. Literally, what, what literally what does exempt mean? Ashley had her hand up. Um, just that you're not eligible for overtime wages. 
Okay. So the, the law was just trying to establish who, who has to be paid overtime and who doesn't have to be paid overtime. And exempt simply means you're exempt from that provision. If you're salaried, we don't have to pay you overtime. Um, the, the benefits of that is that theoretically, if you're salaried, you kind of come and go as you wish. And some weeks you might work less than 40, and some weeks you work more than 40, and it kind of averages out. If you're non-exempt, what does that mean? You can. All right, Ashley, did you start to say something? And then we'll go to Amy. No? Okay, Amy. It basically means that if you work um, any hours over 40, that you would be entitled to overtime pay. At what, at what amount? Uh, time and a half um, on uh, regular overtime and then on the weekends, um, depending on where you're at, sometimes you get double time and then holidays premium pay. Okay, good deal. So when you are, when you are under the provisions of the law, you're not exempt from it, you get paid time and a half for the hours you work over 40 in a week or if you choose comp time, you get an hour and a half for each hour that you work. It's still time and a half, either in dollars or in time. Um, that's, that's uh, to me, an interesting little provision that some folks don't know about. But uh, I have a daughter who worked with the National Park Service a couple of years ago, and she would have some weeks where she put in a lot of hours when they were having day camps and things like that. Uh, and she was really trying to, to press them for overtime. And they were giving her the option. Well, they weren't really giving her the option. She was trying to get time and a half on her wages. Uh, but they were saying, nah, we, we don't have the budget for that. Um, just, take, just take a day off for the, for the time you put in. And, in, and her mom and I, uh, her mom who has an HR degree and I who teach HR, uh, were trying to communicate to her that the, the law says that it's, it's time and a half. Regardless of whether you pick dollars or hours, it's, it's literally 1.5. 1, 1. Um, so the, the folks who are under the provisions of this law get a bonus if they work extra. Uh, and that applied to the to the hourly people, but it didn't apply to most salary people. All right, Amy's got her hand up. Yeah, um, I just wanted to get verification on that. That's a federal law, not a state law, right? On the um, comp time being time and a half. Correct. Where can you get more information about that? Because that's something that's been a very hot topic um, where I'm at, and I've never really been able to get clarification on that. Uh, I will go and uh, try to look that up. We, we did a little bit of research. Oh, look, Paul's, Paul's coming in. Are you ready for bed, buddy? All right, I'll come see you in a little bit. swimming in the bathtub. Swimming in the bathtub. All right. <laughs> see you later, buddy. All right, that was Paul. Paul's a good friend of uh, Gina's boys. Gina, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Um, and Amy, you can you can look up the comp time. Um, you can look under the wage and hour division for their comp time rules to see that it is time and a half. It's a federal um, mandate. It's not a state um, state by state decision. And it's actually something that um, we at Georgia Southwestern we're we're beginning to utilize comp time for our non-exempt employees to help offset these additional costs that are coming with the new overtime rules. Um, but if you go under the wage and hour division, look at their comp time rules, um, that's a good starting place for you. Okay, yeah, because a lot of times we use the Code of Federal Regulations, and I've just never been able to find anything in um, something like that that specifies the time and a half for comp time. And there's also, under the comp time provision, there's a max accrual that someone can earn before the employers are required to pay overtime. So they can only okay. defer comp time up to... Um, I believe it's 240 hours a year before they're required to pay overtime. Uh, okay. And that's also stated in the regs. This all gets pretty detailed and pretty interesting. Yeah, um, you've got so employers, oh, I'm sorry, Mark, <laughs> but you've got go employers ahead. that are starting to, to really look outside the box. And, and again, it, it's something we've never really utilized comp time before, but, you know, employers, because we're facing significant changes with the, the salary threshold has more than doubled. Um, and, and so you've got to get creative and I think you're going to start seeing more and more employers 
utilizing the comp time, but they have to use it properly <laughs> and making sure it is time and a half. Um, it will be paid out if not used up in, in, in a certain time frame. So it's not like the employers are off the hook in paying their employees. If they earn time and a half, they're going to receive time and a half, whether in time off or actual pay. All right. Uh, you made the, the comment that it's more than doubling. That's come up a couple of times here. So effectively what's happening is that the, the threshold of 23,660 meant that if you earned less than that, you were theoretically entitled to overtime or else you were miscla misclassified as salary when you should have been hourly. Uh, but once you hit that 23,6 in your salary, your employer could, could legitimately work as much as he or she wanted to. Uh, and you they, and could could reasonably uh, demand that you work 60 or 80 hours, and all you really could do is say I quit, um, because they didn't have any legal obligation to pay you for anything over that. There may have been some moral considerations or ethical considerations, but but nothing legal. But this this law now or this ruling by the Department of Labor says that uh, if you don't make at least 47 476, then you've got to be paid overtime. So the options now that HR has or that organizations have is to step back and say, all right, how many people do we have that make between 23.6 and 47.4? Those are the ones who are going to be affected. All right, of that group, how much are we theoretically going to have to pay in overtime? Because if we make a decision to just raise their salary to 47.4, four, seven, six, now the issue is closed again because we can work them as much as we want to over the 40 hours if they're at that bottom threshold. So one of the, one of the, one of the um, things that the financial people have to work out, the HR people, the personnel people, the payroll people, whoever, is how much are we theoretically going to have to spend if we try to move everybody from the current minimum to the new minimum? And if a big number, then we have to start asking questions like, okay, uh, if we can't afford to move everybody up to the 47.4, how do we better control the hours they work so that they don't have overtime? All right? What's the obvious disadvantage or uh, challenge to the organization if we just decide we're going to move everybody up to the new minimum? Everybody who is making 23.6 is now going to be making 47.4. And then we don't have to worry about this overtime stuff anymore. What's the challenge? Most businesses aren't going to be able to give people that high of a bump in their pay instantaneously. All right. Good point. Uh, can we afford to effectively double a lot of our employees' pay? Now, we're assuming that they're at the 23.6. If, if they're already making 44, that's not that big a deal, is it? We just give them a $3,000 raise. Um, and, and that's one thing that we got to take into account here. What's the, what's the standard salary? Is it in the 30 range on average across America? We're looking at a you know, $15,000 raise, which is half of their salary. Obviously, the people who are lower towards the 23 have a bigger impact than the folks who are higher towards the 47. So we have to do a little bit of math somewhere. You know, what, what does this likely do to us financially? How many people are involved? How much does the money add up to? Um, but if we've got a fixed amount of money to use on salaries and suddenly we're having to pay people time and a half what they did or double what they did, depending on what their salary was, what does that do to our organization? What does it do to our solvency? Gina, what's the challenge at the college? Well, and, and, and for one thing, we're state funded. We're very limited resources. Um, and you're right, there's a temptation, especially for those employees who are so close, already closer to the threshold to go ahead and bump them. But then you also have to think this threshold is going to automatically increase three years from now. And we don't know what the new threshold will be. 
and then three years from then and three years from then this is you know every three year cycle so you may have the funds today to bump those but this is just wave one can you sustain that going forward and I was at a, a meeting a couple of months ago and they said based off of trends currently um, the next increase they're looking at around 51,000 the second increase you're looking mid 50s and then the third increase you're close to 60,000 um, the, the new salary threshold so that's something that has been a challenge for us because um, the, the temptation is, is so tough, you know, to go ahead and bump someone. And so what we've had to do is look at, from a cost perspective, what's the best cost-wise. Is this someone who receives a lot of overtime? If so, how much? How much could we anticipate paying? And it may not make sense to bump them. It may, uh, cost-wise, make, make sense to go ahead and let them move to non-exempt hourly paid. And then you have other positions that when you do the math and you're going to spend $12,000 in overtime, it's more cost effective to go ahead and bump them $3,000. So we're still weighing those options. On top of that, though, we can't overlook, we still have to look at the duties test as well to make sure these positions are truly exempt positions because salary is not enough. And so in you know, higher education, Obviously, you've got teachers who are exempt, no matter what their salary is. You have to look at your computer professionals. You have to look at your executives and your administrative professionals to determine if the duties that you currently have them ranked as exempt, if that's true. Um, so we've had we've done a complete overhaul on all of our positions to make sure it's not just salary that's a good starting point, but you have to look at their duties as well. Has that required any overtime on your part, Dina? Lots, but I don't get paid for it. <laughs> That's yeah. We we want you putting in that overtime now, not December the first, don't we? There we go. And so obviously I'm an exempt professional, so it doesn't matter. I can work till my fingers fall off, and, and that's my choice to do so. Um, thinking about being exempt versus non-exempt, um, I like to look at it as task-driven. You know, with exempt professionals, and I think Dr. Grimes, you mentioned this earlier. Some weeks you may work over 40, you may have weeks you work less, you're going to get paid your flat salary. It's task driven um, as long as the job is done versus hourly driven where you have to be at work, you have to be you know, on the clock to be paid. Um, but yeah, lots of time and, and really we've been tracking this for many months, I mean even back going to last year. Um, and I went back, I was looking at some notes earlier as a university system, we've started having conference calls December of last year as we were starting to see the proposal and what that looked like and starting planning for it. So you're talking months and months and months of preparation and then even ongoing months and months of work that's going to go into it. It's not just, okay, we've got everybody ready to go December 1st. It's something we have to keep assessing um, every day. And this is not just salary money either because what else gets impacted by increases in salaries? Their benefits, their retirement, their benefits, um, and then even comp time while some you know managers automatically think okay well comp time that's great they'll earn time and a half off we'll just give them the time off but if you find yourself in a situation that you can't find the time to give them off, you're going to end up paying that out. And if they've received a merit raise, you're going to pay it at the higher salary of what they're earning. Um, at our institution, if let's say I have an employee in human resources who's earned 60 hours of comp time and then that employee transfers to the business school of business, I have to pay them out of my bucket, out of my um, budget. So yeah, their benefits are salary based as well. So as we're increasing, salaries, their life insurance is increasing, their retirement is increasing. It's not just their annual rate of pay that we have to take into consideration. So any vacation payout, anything like that. It does hit us several different ways. Correct. And that's that's part of the the complicated calculations here. One thing that, that uh, Gina was mentioned earlier that per, um, potentially if the schedule goes the way that uh, folks are kind of anticipating it, in the course of a decade, that number could go from 23.6 to like 60 something. 
which is a, a huge increase over the course of 10 years. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean we have to pay them that much money, but we're potentially on the hook for that if, if they're working lots of hours. We've got to start making some of those decisions. Because just like with the minimum wage increases, when we increase the threshold um, at which we have to start or, or below which we have to be paying overtime, that money probably isn't just sitting out there growing on the tree in the backyard. How are we going to get the money to fulfill the obligation related to this directive? If our current, if our current payroll is uh, $200,000, and this is going to potentially increase it to, let's say, $350,000. Where does that one hundred and fifty come from? Plus benefits. Well, it could come from raising the cost of our goods and services to the public. Could, could come from, um, I don't know, help me out here. Uh, Renee. Um, okay, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, they're, they can um, get rid of other employees and just make the salary employees do more work. work okay. Better. All right, Amy? They could reduce some of the benefits that they have been offering the employees. All right, yeah. That's one thing I hope you learn in labor management relations is that sometimes when we when we gain something in one area, we offset it by losing something in another area. Uh, we may be forced to change the structure of our benefits. Maybe part of the way that we compensate for this is lowering our insurance premiums by raising deductibles and things like that. Um, so what are some other things that we can do? If we're, if we're torn between the idea of raising people's salary to the new threshold if, uh, if we don't want to have to pay out a lot of overtime and we don't want to have to raise their salary, keeping in mind that the, the salary threshold is irrelevant if they're not working overtime. So if we've got people that are working overtime, that are not at the new threshold, what are our options? One is increase the salary and forget about the overtime. One is just to pay them the overtime and keep their salary where it was. What other options are there? To just switch up the duties. Okay, by doing what? Uh, so the lower paid people, well, employees, um, they don't have as technical of Basically, they don't have the as technical of work, and then you shift the more technical, the more difficult stuff to a higher paid employee who may be exempt and can work beyond that 40 hours to make up the difference. Okay. So perhaps we shift hours to people who are already at the threshold because there's no overtime pay involved. All right. Is it an option? to shift hours from the higher paid people to the lower paid people. So you're working 60 hours at 45,000 a year, and he's working 40 hours at $25,000 a year. Just shift those extra hours to the lower paid employee. Amy. It would depend on the duties that are being shifted. If there are duties that are being shifted that are at the same pay rate that they're currently working at, then that would be fine because you could kind of restructure what everybody's doing. But if it's uh, work at a higher pay grade, then no. Okay. And a lot of that depends on what it, what it takes to do those particular tasks. Uh, the lower paid people may not have the ability to do those tasks. It could be that the only people capable of doing those tasks are the higher paid people. Is it an option to bring in some part-time people who won't have the 40 hours? Instead of working you 60, we'll put you at 40 and we'll hire somebody to come in for 20. That might cause a situation where we don't have to worry about the overtime. We don't have to worry about the benefits. But 
where could that end up hurting us if we bring in some some part-time people? Amy. Let's get Amy and then we'll come to Gina. I think employee morale could be uh, damaged by that because when you bring in more employees, then you're having to distribute the hours among all of the employees. Um, otherwise, you take a risk of losing the ones that you've invested in um, and brought on. So I think overall, it's just damaging um, in every way you look at it there. Uh, let me go to Gina real quick, and then we'll come to Kenneth. Yeah, I think Amy uh, nailed it. You're, the morale, which we're already facing morale um, concerns because you're taking individuals who are professional individuals and in some cases they may consider us downgrading their positions because they're moving to non-exempt, although their duties have not changed and we don't view them any less of an employee as they were before. So that's already in, in the minds. But also, you're right, you bring in part-time work or part-time employees could also lower morale. It could um, cause some turnover as well. And bringing on part-time workers is something that employers have been doing for a while as a way to offset the Affordable Care Act. And I know that's not our topic, but if you follow the ACA, it doesn't work in that situation either. You know, as a way to avoid paying benefits, they're not able to retain workers as long as they might could have. So certainly that's one way employers are getting creative. You've got some employers who are mandating no overtime, just outlawing it altogether. You cannot get over 40 hours. You have to get the work done within 40. Um, they're shifting hours around, sharing duties. Um, as Renee said, you know, maybe shifting those duties back up to a salaried manager. Okay. Kenneth. So I was actually going to say um, with the one employee at 40 and the other employee at 20, one of the, the issues is, is that you still got to go through the hiring process, which incurs a cost. and Yes, you got a 40 and a 20, um, the Affordable Care Act. So the 40-hour employees most likely going to get reduced down to where you got two employees working 30. You got somebody that doesn't want to be there anymore because they're not getting compensated or getting as much work as they used to get. So, again, you have a whole lot of hidden costs that comes in with uh, bringing on uh, part-time employees. Okay. Um, what do you think is the the perception that a salaried person has? Uh, on, on the one hand, I'm working 60 hours. You're only paying me for 40. And now you're saying we're going to get somebody else to do the, the, the other 20. All you have to do is work 40. We're going to continue to pay what we already paid. Why might that sound like a bad thing to me? Because I wasn't getting paid the extra time anyway. Uh, and, and as a result of this, I'm getting rid of 20 hours worth of responsibilities. Amy. Some employees would think that if you can afford to go and hire a part-time employee, then you can afford to pay me the money. And um, I continue to do the work as, as normal. But then some employees actually have the perception that you're trying to get rid of me and this person is here to replace me. Okay. Um, one of the, one of the um, philosophical challenges, I guess, for me as that employee is that I'm invested in this project. This is my little project. I'm working on it. And suddenly you're saying, okay, at the end of 40 hours, you hand it off to somebody else who's not as invested in it. Uh, they might finish it. And who's going to get the credit for it? Probably the person who finished it. Um, but there's also the, the possibilities too, if we decide to go ahead and start changing you over from salary to hourly, when you were salary, did you have to justify your time? When we have to, generally speaking, if you were salaried, you didn't. You, you come and go as you please. You come in a little bit late one day. You stay late the other day. You know, as long as as long as we can verify that you were here, that you were working at some point during the day, you got paid your your standard rate. But when we have to start tracking the overtime, you have to start keeping track of your hours, don't you? You can't just say, "Oh, I've worked 45 hours this week." You've got to be able to document that. So the salary people, as Gina was talking about, who see it as a kind of a, a declassification or a demotion, 
say, I never had to track my hours before. And now you're telling me I have to track my hours. Even if I'm getting more money as a result of it, that seems like a, a lowering of my status because it's not the, the white collar people that keep track of time. It's the blue collar people. And there can be a, a stigma attached to that. So while we are trying to, as, as in the case with so many other things that we're talking about in the course of the semester, while we're trying to help people out, giving them more money and so forth, we can inadvertently cause a whole lot of other problems while we're trying to solve one. One thing that has, I think, has already come up in one of the discussions and that came up several times when, when my MBA class was talking about this issue a few weeks back was the idea of ghosting. Anybody know what that means? Kenneth, raise his hand. Um, so not to name any names that, of anybody at my current job, but uh, you, we have employees that they work their 40 and technically they clock out and they just keep working. And they may stay an extra two, three hours. So on the books, it's 40. But if I actually counted it the way that you're legally supposed to count it, they're working maybe uh, 45, 40, no, actually it's more than that. They're working more like 50 to 60 hours a week. So they're working, they're, they're working time that isn't counted on the books. Right. And there could be some either very overt or perhaps covert pressure put on by management that you've got to get this project done. And I don't care if it takes you 60, you're not allowed to clock more than 40. Now, there's, there's ethical problems with that. If there's a law that says we've got to pay you after 40, to, to then stand there and say you can't clock back in, but you've got to finish this job, there will be folks that are pressured by their management to put in whatever hours it takes, even if they're not getting paid when they're supposed to. So there's some discussion about how much that would happen. Uh, the reality is that it probably would happen, although the, the legal side of it says that it shouldn't. The whole point of this is to pay them for those extra hours. All right, Did everybody got that uh, chat that Kenneth just popped up there? We'll put that out on the home page if I can manage to, to get it and save it. Boom. I'll see if I can copy and paste it. All right. Uh, we're going to need to wrap up the call here shortly because it's right up on 9 o'clock. And yep, that just pasted onto my Word document. Okay. So if you don't have the opportunity to, to copy down that labor link, uh, labor link, Fair Labor Standards Act link that Kenneth put up there, I'll post it to the home page so you can go look it up. Um, what final thoughts do you have about this, the, the issue of the new overtime rules? We didn't get as much into the discussion of what do we need to be thinking about as HR to be able to make a recommendation. Um, it's not going to be a question of do we have to do something about it or not. We've got to do something. But what we recommend to senior management will vary, as said, based upon the circumstances of our organization. How many people do we have close to 47? How many are closer to 23? How many folks are putting in a lot of overtime? Um, where is the balance between where paying them the overtime kind of evens out to what we would have paid them to begin with? And where can we save money? Well, where do we have the opportunity maybe to, to shift some hours or to bring in some part-time people. All that kind of stuff is part of the conversation. And it's the kind of thing that HR has got to be thinking about and developing the answer to before the question's ever asked. So Gina, what, what encouragement do you give them? I would certainly encourage them to do their research, look at the articles, look at the regulations, and not be afraid to push back when senior leadership comes forward with new innovative ideas that they think might be able to fix um, some of the problems that, that they're facing, you have to be able to push back. You have to know what's right, what's wrong, um, as Dr. Grimes said, what's ethical in these types of situations. It just takes one employee to um, file a complaint with the Department of Labor and they're in there auditing, you know, your positions, your salaries, and not just in that department. So, for example, if you have somebody that works in, you know, facilities 
and they file a complaint, they're not just going to audit your facilities. They're going to look at your payroll team. They're going to look at your administrative assistants. They're going to look at other positions. Um, so you have to be able, especially when you know laws and regulations are involved, pushback on, on leadership if they're not headed in the right direction. You have to be the voice of reason in these situations. And I think going along with that very intricately is uh, something that you really won't get to experience. Uh, my, talking to my class here, um, one thing that uh, that I've tried to do in previous classes that I haven't been able to work out this semester is to to bring in uh, like like Gina's doing tonight, Janet Siders to be part of one of these calls. Janet was the director of HR at GSW. Uh, she's the one who retired, and then Gina took her place. Janet is uh, is really interesting to listen to because she is uh, she's this tough old gal who will stand up to people and say you're wrong, and she would tell you, and, and Gina would echo this very very quickly, that you've got to have the kind of relationship with senior managers where they don't get ticked off when you tell them they're wrong that they that they understand that you know what you're talking about, and that you are going to challenge them when you think that they're making a bad decision, and that they will listen to what you have to say. Because uh, as Gina references here, there will be times when they say, well, the, the, the easy answer is this. And you've got to be able to say, yeah, that's the easy answer, but it's the wrong answer. Uh, that's going to get us in trouble. Uh, and have them say, okay, tell me why, rather than bite your head off. All right. Let's uh, call it quits there.